global organization which uh, um, is purpose driven and aims uh, at creating a sustainable ecosystem where technology is uh, designed to help uh, refugees uh, to gather solutions uh, which may improve their journey or their life condition. Uh, we are very inclusive, we are working all over the map, almost in every continent, there is a representation of us, I personally represent uh, Berlin, uh, the Berlin chapter, and then obviously our organization is completely uh, purpose driven and free, so we welcome everyone who's in need of looking for answers, uh, figuring out how to become an entrepreneur, or just navigating through the rules of the German bureaucracy. Please uh, reach out to us. Uh, there is an email. We'll share it with you later. The event, as I said, is the first of a series of talks. Uh, and the main purpose of these talks uh, is to bring people who are inspiring and who made it, uh, so to speak, uh, and share their experience uh, experiences in such a way that could inspire new comers, new entrepreneurs, new dreamers to embark on their journey and make something relevant in the tech ecosystem, especially here in Berlin. Not limited, but especially in Berlin. Um, the main point tonight is introducing you to the three amazing speakers who are joining us for this talk. So I would like to warmly or more than warmly welcome Adam, Firas and Jack. Adam is the founder of Team Bay and is also managing his own startup studio, Moala Ventures. Uh, Adam has an interesting background. He migrated to Germany from Syria in 2013 and since then uh, became a very prominent entrepreneur in the scene and also now is giving back to everyone who wants to create and launch its own company. Firas is the founder and CEO of Carbon Mobile. Congratulations, Carbon Mobile uh, just launched uh, its first product uh, one week ago in Germany. It's a fully carbon fiber uh, mobile phone, which, is, which will be available not only online, but also in stores. And then last but not least, Jag, uh, is a serial entrepreneur, an angel investor, uh, is also the managing director of uh, Techstars uh, in Berlin. Techstars is one of the largest accelerators uh, in the world. And he is also an entrepreneur with an interesting journey behind his back. He traveled places, moved countries, and has probably plenty of tricks uh, and tips to share with you guys. So I think I covered it all. I try to be as uh, quick as possible. I want uh, uh, these three amazing people to uh, take the stage and talk a little bit about themselves and their uh, experiences. So if you don't mind, Adam, I would like to start with you. And I would like to ask you um, something about uh, your Moala Venture, so which is probably your latest baby. And I understand that you're providing support and mentorship to new entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, my question would be, is there a proportion or a ratio between uh, migrant-led te tech startups that you're helping versus project in general? Uh, OK, first, let me thank you again, Marco and Shelby, for organizing this. I'm extra excited for participating because, I mean, the topic of it, refugee integration touched home because as you said, I'm a uh, Syrian born and raised. And I did all the journey here in Germany. Uh, it's actually not correct. I'm here off and off since 2006 and in Berlin permanently since 2011. Um, and because I, um, I always had a startup passion. Um, so I quit, uh, I was working as a product manager at Gaufta. It's a startup here in Berlin. I quit it and I started my first startup, which, which is Team Bay. And we just uh, did an exit last year. So in September, we fully exited. Um, and I always had passion for creating new business or introducing new business models to the market. And from there, uh, early on, actually, at Team Bay, I realized, OK, Team Bay is becoming this HR industry expert. And I wanted to stay at the startup level, at the innovative level. And that's how I started Moala Ventures. And I started slowly. And then once uh, I slowly get out of Team Bay uh, operations, I um, official, officially started to take big projects, mainly um, 
so we have two focuses. One was uh, uh, corporates, so helping corporates introduce new business models, uh, or uh, helping solo entrepreneurs uh, navigate through uh, fundraising activities, creating uh, sharp business plans and pitch decks. Um, so this is a quick intro about me and what, what I do. And coming to your questions, uh, was it the question about the refugees uh, or immigrants, right? I, I was just wondering where I have many questions for you. I was just wondering up front, uh, if, if, if you see many migrant led technologies amongst the startups you help or, uh, or what's the ratio? Um, definitely uh, not through Moala Ventures because honestly, they cannot afford us, um, especially if you're a newcomer here or if you have refugee backgrounds, even more difficult. So probably going directly to consulting business is not your best approach. But for example, um, starting with accelerators like Techstars, for example, uh, probably um, uh, Jack would be able to, you know, like reaching out to similar people, people who have accelerators or support network for new founders. This would be our your best bet. Now, when talking to this type of, uh, so because I mentor at Techstars, I mentor at Founder Institute as well, and there, yes, you can see a lot of um, uh, founders with uh, with international backgrounds. Um, and generally, yeah, should I um, answer basically what, what, what yeah, would be absolutely. the difference? Uh, I, I, I was just wondering, so we are here to explore. So whatever, I think your contribution is much more sounder than my questions. Uh, I, was, I was just going to ask you which kind of areas of support you, you, you see most uh, frequently asked. Uh, and, and No, because that, so why, why I also touched the point of accelerators, because in general, I feel like newcomers or new founders, especially if they have immigration background, um, their biggest challenge is to create trust from the market. And this is where similar networks help help in creating the trust. You know, you're new in the market, you, you don't have proof track record yet. Um, so joining an accelerator or a network would slowly build the trust of the market in you. And this is probably would be an extra challenge for a founder with, with a foreign background to solve while solving all the other issues of launching a new business. Absolutely. And then I know that you also personally mentor startups outside of your, let's say, corporate structure. So uh, what's the area that you see is the most, uh, what support is you see is the most needed, especially for people who do not, was, were not born and raised in Germany and maybe uh, didn't came, didn't come on, on a private jet. So again, like definitely to get the trust of the market. And what I mean with this, um, you know, if you are a local entrepreneur and you go to VCs, um, then it will probably to be way easier to convince VC why they should give you that amount of money. Um, and if you are foreign, you don't have that trust. So partnering with networks, for example, Techstars, would be probably a better uh, strategy, especially if it's your first startup. Um, if it's your second startup, then you don't have this issue because you already proved yourself. Uh, but if you're starting uh, and you don't have a network, this would be honestly the one thing that I would recommend for, for people with immigration background who are looking to, to launch a startup. Thank you, Adam. I think it's, uh, it's very important. Trust is definitely uh, probably the, the first big key you need to have to, to enter into a system, in a new ecosystem. And definitely also networking is, is part, but we, we'll touch on it later, but uh, absolutely I do resonate with all your answers. Um, Firas. May I ask you to, as Adam did, to give a little bit uh, uh, about yourself, and then we can we can see if we can ask you something meaningful as well. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Marco. Well, um, I'm Firas, uh, CEO and founder of Carbon Mobile. Uh, started around five years ago. Uh, I'm coming originally from Syria, Damascus. Uh, I grew up there just one year before graduation. The war started. Um, I moved to Dubai from Dubai and then moved to Germany. Along this journey, um, like Carbon Mobile is my fourth startup. Um, all the three startups failed in different reasons, uh, but that was a great amount of learning. Carbon Mobile is for me, it's the most successful thing, although it's the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Um, five years into the journey of uh, starting, like started from Dubai, arrived to Germany, 
uh, I came here with the ambition really when I was like child, I always had this dream of like being an engineer and a German engineering was always the stamp for me of recognition for that. So when we moved to Carbon Mobile here, we had a product in our hand that started first thing and uh, tried to register the company. And that's the first backlash, like speaking about being a migrant and uh, to, to what Adam said as well is that it, it was hard to find the network, it was hard to, to find a lot of things. Bureaucracy hit in my face. Uh, we came here with uh, different, um, uh, with my co-founder back then and also the team, all of them European, I'm, I'm the only Syrian, tried to put my company and I put my visa under uh, under that company and uh, all of a sudden I couldn't do that and I tried to many different ways, almost my visa getting expired to the point that I needed to go through the uh, asylum road. I applied for refugee, uh, I also applied for a place called uh, Halberstadt. And I spent around eight months going back and forth between uh, showing up to uh, like investors and going to incubators, etc. And on the weekend, going back to the refugee camp, kind of, I would say, maybe illegal. Or somebody told me, but I, I needed to do that. I needed to do that for the company because that's the only thing I, I, I really needed to do. So that's a bit of a small background of how I came here. And fortunately, just one week ago, we launched our product. It was like a crazy success for us. We didn't expect that because it went all the way from the US all the way to the biggest media, even in China. And uh, now we got uh, like a huge recognition and we're just on a mission now to start delivery in the next week or 10 days. Which is fantastic. So congratulations. Uh, we met a few years ago, so I know how painful that journey has been. Um, I mean, we could listen to your story for, I guess, for, for, for hours. Uh, what, if, if you had to somehow itemize, what was the thing that uh, proven, proved to be the, most, the biggest challenge through your journey as a, as a CEO and founder of Carbon Mobile? Was it funding? Was it accessing network? Was it uh, having your plans messed up by uh, uh, bureaucracy and regulations and or stuff that you didn't anticipate? So if you had to give an advice and say, <clears throat> pay attention to this before you, you, you go into the next phase of your plan. Well, I think Adam has better advice than me on that. <laughs> like, because he really told like- I don't have a comment. <laughs> <laughs> at that time when I arrived, I did, really didn't know where to go, for example. And the only thing I started is uh, I went to Factory Berlin, for example. I, I, I met a good network back then. Um, I went to Berlin Partner, which they give me a lot, a lot of contacts and network because they want to grow the city in terms of tech startups. And that helped me, but also at the same time, uh, there was big challenges because our project really at that time needed money. And uh, the reason it took five years, it's not really because we were in R&D five years, it was all the other things also five years. And um, uh, raising money in Germany is one of the extremely difficult, unless you're a B2B, SaaS model, etc. And for a hardware product, extremely difficult. Consumer electronics is almost impossible. Deep tech, et it's, it's it's not a thing in, Ger in Germany. And I realized that very late. I Because I was, I was thinking when I arrived to Germany that I'm coming to an industrial country where investment is all like everywhere for that type of thing. But apparently it's, it's a different thing. Investment was one of the most difficult things in Germany. I was surprised at the very end that 95% of our investment is from outside Germany, not from Germany. And we brought it all to Germany. And, and that was a big surprise for me. I didn't expect that. I tried really, really hard. Uh, network, yes, it played a big role, but eventually we grow our network. That helped. And definitely having Germans on the team, that uh, indeed helped a lot uh, over the time. Uh, we grow great, great network on that. Um, the last challenge I'd say is bureaucracy. And yeah, it like almost killed us in different places because the processes, the, there is processes that don't respect startups, I would say, in a, in a way that you, it, it got me confused as well because I have this image before I come to Germany that Germany want to grow to be the next, or Berlin want to be the next San Francisco, but then realize that there's all these things about so many things, company registration, ASOP, etc. Uh, and they realize what the hell is happening? How come you want to be so fast? You want to grow an ecosystem, but you have all of these things. You better fix them first. So we, we suffered on that bit, but that I would say maybe the least one, uh, or at least not me who's one 
like because we have the German, of course, as a foreigner, I would not be able to do the all the bureaucracy things, especially with being in German. Uh, we have other people in the company managing these things, but yeah, I can uh, relate to them. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I, I, I know Adam has a comment or a yeah, question, just, so shoot it. I totally, exactly agree with Firas. Uh, just want to add something um, that, you know, like being an immigrant is, will not add more difficulty for launching a startup. It's just a special thing that you need to care for. If you, if you want to quantify it, let's say you have to do 100 tasks to launch a startup if you're a German, you might need 102 tasks to launch the same startup if you're an um, immigrant. You still have another 100 things to take care of, and this is where you should focus, uh, where, where your focus should be. Uh, and look at all of us, we are proven record that you can do it. Look at Firas, for example, amazing story, like being in a refugee camp, yet he found and managed to do it. And I'm, I bet all his work was on the business plan, on the positioning, on the product, not really thinking, am I an immigrant or am I not? So just, I just want to add this comment because it's still launching a startup. I, I just want to make that comment. Sorry, before I, I know you need to jump to Jack. I just want to make that comment. I definitely put myself in the mindset of not to let this thing of me being a refugee affect me. When I sit with investors or anybody, and although I get friends who are Germans, like who tell me, look what's happening here, we can't see it, like you're getting rejected for investment. I, I try not to think about that because I know that the moment I think about that, I need to stop everything. So I kept trying and I met over the period of Carbon Mobile, over 350 investors from the small fake ones all the way to the big VCs. Um, and I, I tried all the things. I, I, I really tried everything and I can see when somebody don't want to invest, etc. I, I, I have the experience now, but I, this is one of the most important things. But at the same time, there is advantage to being a foreigner as well, I would say, but unfortunately they don't, they don't see it. Maybe you want to tap on that maybe later, but uh, uh, I just want to say a small comment. I came here to Germany and I lost everything before. I put all my money into this project. I arrived to Germany and I throw all my career back in Dubai and I arrived here, I am, I'm, I'm not only at zero, I'm at minus because my family looking at me, what the hell did you do? My friends, what the hell did you do? I ended up in the, in the refugee camp, sitting in a, in a room on two beds on the top floor. And I was like, what, what am I doing? I did something wrong. So from there, I realized that the only way me, for me out of that room is to get this company to survive. And, and that's the thing that for me, I, I'm, you know, like when you lose everything, there's nothing to lose anymore. You're even below that, I lost everything. So I, this is the only thing for me to survive. So I would fight for it. And I think this is maybe an advantage for me over maybe I would say locals. Thank you, Fidesz. That's very, very inspiring. Uh, so, so we are starting to line up a few concepts here. So we said that you need trust, you need to gain trust, you need good networks, access to people who can help you navigate, you need uh, resilience and courage, and a little bit of, uh, I would say, uh, trickiness to, to, to cut the corners. I would love and to hear don't let, from Jack. Don't let the fact, uh, don't let the fact being immigrant distract you. This is another point. This is basically absolutely, what me and Charles absolutely. Are. But then the the buffer is residual, right? So absolutely, I, I agree with you. But then you you as you said, it's just those two more things uh, adding to the thousand that you still need to take care of. Well, on to to Jag. Uh, I want to be mindful of of time. Jag, we know each other, so I know everything about your story, so to speak. Uh, I would love for you to, to give a little bit of a spiel and then I have a couple of questions, given that you, you come from, from a different mindset, which is not entrepreneurial, is, well, you, you have a hat on, which is not of the entrepreneur, but who's the guy writing checks and helping people accelerate their dreams. That's right, that's right. Um, so thank you, Marco, for having me. And, and you know, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to echo, you know, Marco's Marco's sentiments earlier, just just before we we get going. But you know, it's International Women's Day, and and I don't usually participate in in any panels or or events that don't have, uh, uh, you know, don't don't feature women as well. But I thought for two reasons, and I I, I know I spoke to uh, the organizers before for two reasons. One, this is a this is a topic that's you know very clearly important to my heart. But two, secondly, Marco, you know, to echo your sentiments and your thoughts, 
you have an incredible team of women uh, uh, behind you. And so just because they're not visible today doesn't mean that their their uh, output isn't recognized. So I just, just wanted to clarify that and make sure that we, we recognize them as well. Um, you know, my, my background's kind of varied. I'm 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 the grandson of refugees. I'm I'm a migrant myself, uh, first generation migrant, uh, and and you know I recently welcomed a, a son into this world a few months ago, and so he is the son of of migrants on on both fronts. His mother and I are both migrants to Germany, but yet he's born a German citizen, and um, you know it's it's a it's a statistic. You can call it a statistic. You can call it a fact. You can call it whatever you want. But um, the ultimate truth is that. I think when you consider the fact that you know we're, we're immigrants or refugees, we might have slightly we might have had slightly different paths, but you know, everything that works seems to work against us ends up being a huge advantage. And so, you know, to Adam's point, to Feroz's point, and even Marco to, to your point earlier, uh, you know, from from political roadblocks to cultural barriers to, to market differences, I think immigrants and refugees have have an really strong knack for transforming some of the challenges into into strengths and i i love you know that, that there was a little bit of back and forth between adam and firas just now um about this very fact that firas was able to turn his his biggest challenges into also in, into his strengths um i started out as an entrepreneur many years ago i built a few companies sold them and all along the way i was the kid with the funny name the kid with the funny accent I was born in Malaysia, grew up in the US, lived in London. So my accent never quite seemed to match my face. And so whenever I would show up to an investor meeting, they would always be thrown, thrown aback because, hey, wh why do you look like this? Why do you speak like this? And, um, you know, I, I learned early on that, again, you would just have to turn these things to your advantage. Um, Marco, you introduced me as an investor. I, I, I feel guilty because I'm not able to invest in enough immigrants and, and entrepreneurs, right? Like if you look at the backgrounds of, of uh, the two wealthiest men in the U.S., Amazon's founder and, and uh, Tesla's founder, they have strong immigrant or refugee backgrounds. Like you know, Jeff Bezos is the son of a Cuban asylum seeker, and, and Elon Musk also has a has a you know immigrant background. Google, Apple, like when you start to consider the the sheer force um, that immigrants are able to to exert in new countries, and and the, the sheer amount of of um, capital and value, sorry, the sure amount of value that, that these immigrant founders are able to generate for their shareholders, it just, it baffles me why more investors don't think about along the lines of just investing along, you know, investing into immigrant and refugee founders. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to take up too much time about my, my, my background, but again, you know, as a migrant, as someone who has suffered through, uh, you know, whatever sort of ism that you want to apply, racism, like religiousism and whatever, um, Again, you know, ultimately, you just have to figure out how to surround yourself with people who can help you get to wherever you want faster. And so even if you're in the middle of a migrant uh, a camp on the island of Lesbos, there are going to be NGOs, there are going to be corporations, there are going to be people, you know, organizations like TechFugees on the ground who can help you. And so if you can just reach out to them, I promise you, someone will pass their hand back to you. Thank you, Jack. Absolutely. Uh, I, mean, I could not uh, agree more with you. Uh, so we are adding other elements. You need to uh, make your voice heard, uh, exit the shyness shell. And, and definitely there is, a, there, is a, there is an added value in facing challenges, which is that you learn faster to turn challenges into opportunities. Uh, I think this is the real message that should give hope. I have a question for you. I know you don't like being called an investor, although you 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 represent probably the largest portfolio on <laughs> on the planet. Um, but I mean, you screen in Berlin only, I think, over a thousand application per program that you run. Can you can you can you spot a pattern in the ones who then get in? Can you, if you were to advise uh, an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur? What would be yeah. the quality, the skill set, or the qualities that they should have, or not to forget to have? I would just go back to the. It's basically there, there's you know as investors we're looking for signals at, at every juncture at every interaction. All we do is look for look for signals, right? And then we do a bunch of we we call it AI in our heads, but actually it's just pattern matching. But if I were to to do a bit of pattern matching, I would say it's it's the inner drive and motivation that that. You know, propels the founder forward, and then the willingness to receive and accept help 
I think those are the two strongest signals that you can send to any investor. Um, you know, you can call it coachability, but actually it's, it's just that willingness to actually receive and accept help. One of the challenges that I've, I've, I've encountered, especially when dealing with, um, actually, you know, we, we have a lot of, we, we do a lot of outreach to founders that have refugee backgrounds. And, and a lot of this is building on the work that my colleague, I think many of you know, Ahmed, Ahmed uh, Bayram, Sofian Bayram has, has, has done, including with his book, you know, he's documented a lot of the stories of, of you know, just a small microcosm of refugees from, from Syria in particular, but, but he's able to kind of, he's been able to kind of publish a lot of that work. Um, and, you know, one of the challenges I, I find is just that, that fear of asking for help. Um, I don't know if it's ego. I don't know if it's just, you know, fear of being rejected. God, only, I, I can only imagine what some of these, these people have, have gone through, what some of these founders have gone through, uh, you know, the harrowing experiences that they, on their journey to wherever they are now. But I go back to that, what I said, that willingness to receive and accept help, that's something that any investor will find crucial. And so, you know, obviously there's a balance. You, you don't want to show that you know nothing, but at the same time, if you can just show areas that, that, in, that a specific investor might be able to open a few more doors or, or give you some tips on specific things, I think that's what separate, separates a good investor from the, the, the fake small investor that Firas was just talking about. And uh, can, can I ask something? I like I cannot agree more. Thank you, thank you, Jack. Especially for putting it, like pointing out directly, fear of rejection. I think that's something for a lot of immigrants. But I just want to add my own experience. Like once you face this fear, which is literally the only fear that prevents refugees or immigrants from starting a new business. Once you face it, you will realize. Or may, maybe you will get no's from people who are afraid of working with others, but you will get ten more yeses just because you have a story and just because there are many more people who because of that, they want to help you. So you just need to put yourself out, out, out there and face that fear. That's very true. So yeah, I mean, the, we, are, we, are, we are painting kind of a, a, a better scenario, right? At the, going through our conversation because then, then there is also an additional element which, which you shouldn't forget that there is tons of people out there willing to help. And not only because they are unbiased, but also because they recognize that from existing challenges, you can extract additional value. So the, I guess that, I mean, just to sum up what the three of you said, be vocal, don't be shy, don't sit back. If you have a question, if you have a doubt, uh, you may encounter closed doors, but then sooner or later, someone will answer and will let you in. So it's a very positive message, the one that you, you guys are sending today. And, I have another question for Jack. Sorry, I don't want to, uh, I'm, I'm not keeping time of, of how democratically I'm allocating time, but uh, Jack, and then this probably could be a good question for, for the three of you. As, as techpreneurs or as uh, stakeholders in the, in the tech ecosystem, what's the real value of money for you? And I would like to start from Jack since he's the one writing checks. Uh, it's simple. Money is the least valuable thing that I provide to any company that I'm investing in, um, right? It's, it's whether it's the experiences that I've had that I'm hoping to translate and, and share with the founder or whether it's the connections that I, I hopefully can make, or if I can't make them, I will try and find some of them. I think those go way, way further than, than you know, the, the, the small text that I'm able to write. You have a different view on it. On money. On, on. Yeah. What's what? If you look at back back at your uh, uh, city, maybe. Uh, because I am here for a big dream, the money is just to uh, just help us to approach dreams. And I think should hit the fan, or uh, the one who just simply disappeared, um, which gets me pissed, of course. But I'm I'm really glad to have such uh, investors as well with us that comes not only with the money, but also with the value they bring with them. 
And I feel like sometimes a lot of investors say, uh, say that, but I do feel it. I do feel what kind of investor can bring value. Some of them, they just say it. Some of them, they just do it, you know? And, and um, like last year, we were running into bankruptcy of the company and uh, we managed to turn it around, but seriously without the, 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 the support, the mental support even of the investors who really saw like four years almost being thrown away uh, in front of us, I, I wouldn't be able to be here. Yeah. And Adam? Yeah. You... Um, I agree with both what Jack and Jara said. I just want to elaborate that probably I was just thinking that it's even an advantage for us um, that we can throw ourselves and work on the business and forget about the money because for locals or for, me, for all entrepreneurs who want to raise money, they get stuck thinking what, you know, how, what's the valuation of my company, how much I need to raise, what's, what we should call the funding round. Whereas in reality, you should focus on what, will you, what impact will you create. And for example, Firas touched a, a very good point that it was an advantage for him to throw himself at the startup and not think about money anymore. Like we just need to focus on, on, um, uh, on making it work. And that is an advantage in my opinion for us as, as people with foreign backgrounds because we don't have fear of, of not having the money. Uh, so this could be utilized for, for your own advantage. So focus on the impact, focus on how to make it work and forget about everything else money-wise. Uh -huh. Thank I just you. want to mention one important point. Uh, I think Adam kind of highlighted that. Um, and I've seen a lot of that from friends who are refugees here in Berlin or with maybe some migrant background as well, uh, who wanted to start something, but they're extremely afraid of losing everything. And uh, because they are hanging to the opportunity they managed to get after losing everything and coming, arriving here in Germany. And just like, I got this thing, called the refugee passport and some benefits and the job, uh, whatever it is. And they are afraid to take the opportunity and uh, which is kind of right. And it's, I, I wouldn't say they're not right. They're right because the system doesn't help them in general. Yes, if you do take that opportunity, all the benefits, you will lose it on one side. But, <clears throat> but I think this applies to any entrepreneur, whether you are a refugee migrant or even a local, um, you would, uh, there's something important is that like once you really go that rock bottom, you would always be afraid to go rock bottom. And that was like the scariest thing ever in my life to go rock bottom. I did, I, that happened with me three times in this company and also previously, but this company, I hit rock bottom in like in minus B, in a big degree. And once you go there, then your, your tolerance, like your, you stretch your tolerance by great extent. So when, when things happen, go rough again and again, you just get that, uh, I wouldn't say used to it, it's a bad thing, it's a bad habit to get used to that. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I think that's what most entrepreneurs are afraid of or wannabe entrepreneur are afraid of, is that I, don't, I wanna take that opportunity, but without losing everything, that's not gonna work. You gotta take both. But unfortunately the system in Germany Maybe, I don't know, like migrant refugees may be different, but doesn't support that to a good extent. And there is no support for failure in a good extent here compared to San Francisco, for example. It's like kind of a, uh, not a good sign. I, at least that's what I've seen um, Yeah, from around me. Cool, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, I guess I have probably the, the flip question, the devil's advocate one since you still need to put some gasoline in your, in your rocket, right, in order to take it off the ground, what would be the advice to give to, uh, uh, I'll say, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs uh, to access funding, in your opinion? And I would say that you are free to start uh, in no specific order. I would start with Jack, that probably has the, the, the most tricks to share. Um so th this is this is if you are a refugee, how do you is is the question here? If you're a refugee, I, I would just say that we we now we we are we are happy enough to say that it doesn't really make a huge difference. So talking just about accessing funding, what would be your your uh, tips or advice that you give to someone who wants to become an entrepreneur? Obviously, given that it's it's hard for everyone, but it's even harder if you have a, a refugee background. It's actually the same advice. I, so it's the same advice I give 
every founder, right? Regardless if if you being you being a straight white man or a, in your case straight Italian man, you know, um, I think the 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 fundamental challenge with founders and startup founders and investors is that there's a power imbalance between those two. The minute a founder has to pitch an investor for money, it, you know, the, 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 the dyna dynamic changes because now the investor is the one holding all the perceived power. Your job as a founder, whether you're an immigrant, whether you're a migrant, whether you're a refugee, whether, whether you're a, a, you know, a, a uh, privileged founder, right? Whatever, whatever the term you, you, you uh, ascribe to, your job is to change that power dynamic back in your favor. As a founder, you're the one holding the cards. You should be the one getting the investor to pitch you, right? And, and it's easier said than done. I, I totally appreciate that. There's lots of nuances, but you should be the one telling you as the founder should be the one telling the investor that they are the one on your journey, right? It's not the other way around. Your company can exist without the investor, but the investor does not exist without the founder, without the startup, without that engine of growth that they're, they're putting their gasoline or, or coins or whatever it is so that they can make more coins. That can't happen without you, the founder. And so it's your job to remind the investor, it, not maybe not, not, as, not so directly, but it's your job to show that investor that you, know, you have a lot of power and you do, because again, there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur, right? Like you've got corporations, governments, NGOs, think tanks, businesses, large, small, accelerators, incubators, angel investors, like you, you throw a stone and like, you know, literally everyone's calling themselves an angel investor these days. All these people are aligned and they are seeking opportunities and you could be one of those opportunities. So as long as you present yourself in that way, and as long as you address that power and balance, I've always found that founders have an easy time accessing capital. Thank you, Jack. That's probably, we should not record it. You're giving away too many secrets here. <laughs> it's funny, you'd be surprised. I've, I've, told, I've said this so many times, yet you know, I, I, still, I still see founders falling into the same traps. It's very true. What, what about you, Adam? What's your... What's your advice? What's the two oh, cents here? I, I wouldn't basically add noise to what Jack said. It was perfect. So maybe I will go one layer down and say like for the start. Um, unfortunately, as a, as a new startup, I, I didn't find any program that is tailored for people, who, especially for refugees, for example. I didn't find any government program that does invest in um, refugees or give special advantage for um, or, or um, yeah like um, prefer let's say uh, refugee founded uh, startups but on individual levels I think the job center has something where you could sponsor the first 12 months if you if you apply for some kind of freelance uh, status um, and for that you need a business plan uh, I'm, I'm not sure of the details but maybe there would be a good starting point at least if you are thinking about new business you can for 12 months forget about the pressure of, of paying rent. Again, I'm not expert. I, I, I really don't dig deeper into, into that. So but probably Job Center would be a good starting point. If you are a bigger startup, yeah, I, I, I don't know any program that do, for example, seed rounds. There are the traditional government uh, program, for example, exist. This is probably one of the most famous or more famous one. Um, that would not make any, like it wouldn't make any difference if you are uh, foreign or not. Uh, it all did uh, fall down to how good is your business plan, how convincing um, you are in knowing how will you bring, you know, the value that you're thinking about into the market and getting money from it. It's as simple as that. Um, so the bigger the startup is, the, the, the less relevant the fact if you're a refugee or not For sure. in terms of funding. Firas, since you've been knocking on over 300 doors, what's your secret sauce here? No, I don't have a secret sauce. What I want is uh, get one-on-one -on -one mentorship with Jack, maybe, to, <laughs> to help me on how to, how to do that. Um, uh, well, th thanks a lot, Jack. Like, really, uh, what you said make a lot of sense. Um, yes, there is this resistance uh, for me being a, a foreigner refugee uh, of being open to my story. But to be honest, you're right. Like one of our biggest investors 
he was kind of like resisting, not knowing whether they want to put money or not. And then the moment he realized how much I've been through, which I don't tend to tell my story. And to be honest, this is the first time I tell my story like publicly. I, I, I don't like to go public with my story. And um, and he realized the story. I was like, man, you went through shit and back and and you're still doing this. And it's been four years and you 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 will do something out of my money. I'm going to put with you and I'm going to help you. And also he decided that he wants to be also an advisor with the company. So that's been a great help. So I I'm definitely uh, agree with you on that. The, the point that Adam mentioned um, about, yes, as you grow, this become irrelevant. Uh, and when you're early stage, this is relevant. And I, and I do see that. I, I, and it comes with a package. Yes, if Adam, you mentioned at the beginning, like if you're, this is your second startup, first startup, also it plays a role as well. Um, <clears throat> I, I think this is all, it, it all plays together as well. Fantastic. So since we are probably almost running out of time and there is tons of questions for you guys to answer, I have just probably the last uh, site-specific question for you. Uh, given that obviously we, we, we assessed uh, that there is no such a huge difference uh, when you want to start a company in uh, uh, Germany, whether you, you come from Germany or you don't, uh, what would you think is needed from a structural standpoint to change to make uh, accessing to entrepreneurship easier? Which is not necessarily just funding, it's, it's about regulations, uh, access to information, networking. Do, do you have any views here? Obviously, we are, the topic is people with a, with a migrant background, so it adds a little bit of a complexity. If you were to advise government, uh, or policymakers, what would you say? I mean, I, I would like to start with basically exactly the point that I said. I would love to see government programs that like with a focus on startups with refugee backgrounds. I know that, um, you know, you, they probably need you guys like TechFugee as partners to filter out the noise and invest in the right startups because probably that's an experience the government cannot have. Um, but it is doable. It's totally doable that you can create programs um, that you know support startups with uh, um, or, or led by immigrants, um, but and at the same time not throw your money. And also for the job center, and of course for the Auslander Behörde, the, the infamous Auslander Behörde, they should be more relaxed about trusting um, those people who who are thinking about doing something new. They shouldn't freak out. Again, maybe they can engage engage with tech refugees to filter out the noise, um, but they should do more to allow giving them quickly a visa and letting them go uh, and start experimenting with their startup as soon as they can. Good point. Any any of the two of you have anything to add? Even from a, a I guess from a more technical and bureaucratical standpoint, the the amount of paperwork that you need to go through in order to create your company, the uh, language barriers, uh, the cost of having professionals looking after the step from zero to one. Is there anything you would change looking back? I just, uh, sorry, again, I know I'm saying again, I would like to ask for us also about it because we touched it. But for example, like bureaucracy, again, it, you will spend so much time if you, if you try to make it perfect. I, I literally did not think about my, res my residency for many, many years. I could have got the German citizenship maybe 2015, but I was in the mid of fundraising for Team Bay and I literally did not think about my residency. I lost my blue card and I kept renewing every year because I simply knew that, okay, there's a lot of mess that they need from me and I just don't have energy now to think about that. And probably that is a mentality or tolerance that we need to develop because we all know that yes, it is some, it's, you know, German, Germany has a bureaucracy problem and it's probably bigger if you have to deal with Ausland ever heard it. So, you know, be ready and maybe don't waste energy there, still waste, waste it on making your start, startup successful. I hear you. I would go yes. last. I would go last. Okay, Jack. <laughs> I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this I, you know, as, as a former political strategist. Um, I think politicians respond well to numbers, right? And so when you throw facts at them, like the number of the sheer amount of value that's been created by immigrants and migrants in the US, for example, like, you know, I think 50% of the Fortune 500, Fortune 100 
companies were set up by people with immigrant backgrounds or either first generation or, or second generation. Um, yeah, I think there, there was a stat again from my colleague Ahmed uh, Sufyan Bayram's book that I think 65% of the respondents in, in his surveys specifically said they didn't set up a business because of the complexity um, of you know, the, the, the paperwork. I mean, as someone who uh, has a lot of privilege, it's, it's a nightmare for someone like me to navigate the notar system and, and you know, the, the various uh, uh, very complicated bureaucratic maneuvers that, that, are, that are put, uh, that are placed by the government. As, if someone like me is having trouble, I, I can only imagine what it's like for someone who doesn't have the comfort and safety um, that I have to, to have to go through that, to have to navigate those channels you know, I think the simplest thing we, we we should be doing more, and the government should be should be doing more, is just replicating things like these forums, like these, where you know if if more people hear that it can be done, if more people hear that actually you should use all these again disadvantages to your advantage by talking about them. You know, Firas himself so brilliantly put it: if if he had told his story maybe a little bit sooner, some of the investors might have gone, "Holy crap, you're." You're, you know, and it's the same thing that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling. You know, my, my kind of, the the hairs of my my arms tingled when he talked about his story because, uh, you know, that's the that's the exact type of investor, uh, that's the exact type of founder that I want to invest in, right? And if 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 there's people like me willing to invest, I'm willing to bet there's a whole lot of other people also willing to invest in 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 founders that that can explain the challenges that they've gone through and the lengths that they're going to go through to protect my money and also grow their business. And so if you can kind of close that circle and, and keep repeating that story over and over again, I think more people will, will one, understand that, hey, it can be done, that, yeah. You know. And secondly, I think it's also for the migrant or the refugee to understand that the, the you know, the path to success is never paved with, you know, gold, right? Like it's, there's always turns and, 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 you know, it's like, it's like that game snakes and ladders, you know, one, one day you're going up the ladder, the next day, the snake's kind of putting you down. That's entrepreneurship. That's the, that's the, you know, uh, uh, like there's no way around it. What you've got to do is to make the best of that situation. And so if the German government is, is throwing all these hurdles at you, well, then you still have options. You know, it's not hard to incorporate your company in another country. You know, even today, you can, as a as as someone who's living in Germany, you could set up a Delaware C Corp in twenty minutes. You could set up a UK limited company in, in under a day, with one tenth or one hundredth the cost of setting up a company in Germany. And so, if the German government, and, and you know, we're talking about Germany specific today, if German politicians start to see that there's a whole bunch of capital flowing out of Germany, a whole bunch of ideas and knowledge flowing out of Germany into you know, Delaware C Corp structures or UK limited company structures, they're going to make a difference. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to at least pay attention. Thank you, Jack. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Jack. You really tapped into important points and uh, stuff that really uh, I personally struggled with, to be honest. Um, I just, maybe I would add a little bit on that. I think on, I'll start from the media perspective where you also mentioned, I think, uh, that personally hurts me, like because I know there's a lot of stories. I didn't know about Jack before. I didn't know about Adam before. I didn't know about a lot of foreigners who are doing amazing jobs. The only thing I see on media is like the the amount of uh, shawarma businesses that's flowing and <laughs> increasing. Like, come on, really? Is that the measure of success? Uh, with all respect to them, but that's not what we're looking here for. And that's not what people on the street want to have a not only the recognition of businesses, but also the recognition of like also respect to what these people can bring, not only the shower or falafel shop. There's much more important things. And I know a lot of people who don't have that access to, to media. And for example, I don't seek media and people who try to seek it, unfortunately, this is the other side of the story, is that when I see refugees going on, on, on news or et cetera, is a, is a, is a self-victimization shop a show that's on one side, the, the, the refugee is playing the victim. On the other side, the other person, I don't want to say who is that, but whoever that other person holding them and like pets. And I was invited for that kind of shows. And I was looking what kind of the end result that looks on me. I was like, no, I'm not a pet here. And when I tried to so, show them that I am above that level, I was kicked out because they realized 
No, you need to be that pet, that kind of pet. I'm really sorry, my language is harsh here, but this personally hurts me so much. That's on one side. Um, so I, I feel definitely organizations like tech refugees and other organizations that take this thing seriously, not to by petting like people or migrants, refugees, but by really taking them seriously, they can make an impact and make that as an example to many other peoples. That's what we need to see. And that's even why I didn't wanna, like one of the reasons I never wanted to talk about my story is that I never wanted to be, uh, while before shipping my product, you know, and when you sent me two weeks before my launch, you didn't know that I'm launching, but I thought, okay, that's after the launch, I'm confident about my product and I can now go and talk because I don't wanna feel like being a fraud, you know, and, and I'm abusing my, my title. On the media, I had every opportunity on our media to, to use my name and to say the refugee. And even the PR company were like, hey, you better use that. And I told them, no, I did fucking innovation. I did amazing things. And that should stand out on the media. It's not me. I created that thing and that thing, thing should stand out. So um, that, that was on one side. On, on the political side, uh, it's even worse, <laughs> unfortunately, because I mean, why do I have to go to that refugee route? I didn't choose that. Why all our employees and people were able to, uh, just because they're Europeans, just stay here. And for me, it was like, I went to the IHK Chamber of Commerce. I went to different places. So like, and it was 2017, it was not spike of Syrians. So, and they look at me like, how do we get you in? We don't know how to deal with Syrians now. And they said, we, sorry, we cannot handle this now. Until I realized that the only way out to go for a fish camp. Four years later, which is now, I came early 2017, four years later, just now, two days before the event, two days before we launched our product, and crazy efforts happening, Iris and of course, there's one thing a refugee would always be afraid of, being kicked out of this country. And that's very scary. And that's something I, I fear because I traveled to China. You, like I, I went through terrible things when I went there. It's really hard things like uh, traveling back and forth visas. It's a nightmare. You don't want to need to, you know, maybe Adam knows a little bit before about that. Um, but just two days before the launch, I received the paper that I was always afraid of here in Germany from the German government. And it felt to me that I'm launching my product in two days and this is the recognition that I got. Thank you so much, here's a paper. I don't wanna go through the, the details of the paper but it's the thing that it was my nightmare and it arrived and I didn't finish with it yet and I'm handling it. So, um, and that's definitely not the thing I expected at all, being in Germany and try. We spent a lot of money in Germany. We brought a lot of money from outside to here. That's all not being recognized at all. And I know that bureaucracy plays here and they say, that's a, that's a refugee system and all these things around it. They don't see that, they're blind. And that's whatever you're doing here is different. And I hope they see it. That's what I'm trying. I have a lawyer, I hope they see it. Yeah, so that's my point. Uh, I I just want to thank you so much for us for also showing vulner vulnerability. I, I also, from my own story, I totally relate as well. I just want to touch the point of, um, especially for us, maybe first generation Syrian, for example, as like, if we consider in the last five years, there was like this wave. Um, we are facing, um, or we did face things that we couldn't find publicly, or we, yeah, we couldn't find success stories that could you know, keep our motivation up. So we had to suffer a little bit more um, but if you are like maybe for the entrepreneurs out there with us today that want to launch a business, if you think that where you come from will play any factor in the success of your business, then please hang out with people like us. Don't hang out with, I don't know where you're sourcing your media or news, but don't do that. Hang out with people like us. And, um, and this is why I got so excited about Tikfuji when they want to pick uh, or increase their um, uh, operations in, in Germany because we definitely need it. Here an example, there's first generation of people who did it and would be more than happy because we are clearly passionate to, to give you free support um, in order to solve this and hopefully avoid you know, 
traumas or like or more fears being created because there are success stories and media only talk about you know what what would peak emotion they don't talk about um small stories that will inspire um smaller numbers thank you thank you guys i, I mean i have this feeling that uh, you could keep on going forever on this uh, conversation which which was the, the goal of this uh, little meetup that is like becoming very interactive i'm also looking at the time i would like to uh, at least try to answer a couple of questions from from the audience and then we can wrap it up and move it into the um, meet and greet kind of part of this uh, of this talk and so probably more questions will arise if you manage to be there fantastic otherwise uh, we'll we'll keep it for the next time so we will force you to come again I don't um, know. Uh. so i i'm i'm sorry i cannot join the the networking but uh, only because i have something to deliver by tomorrow but i just want to say uh, you all can find me on linkedin and again the this the topic i'm generally passionate about so please reach out with any questions and I'll be happy to, to support any, any entrepreneur with an idea. You can find me on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Okay. No worries, Adam. Are you, so you are bound to come back again on this uh, stage, virtual stage. I would like to I'll ask Shelby, who's the mastermind behind this event, to, to see if there is at least one or two questions we, we can try to answer. Uh, and then before we wrap it up. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for, for adding your questions here. Um, the one I would like to start with is actually from Zabi. Um, and the question is, to what extent is qualification important in terms of founding a startup? Um, he's, he mentions he has lots of ideas, but not sure um, if he has the qualifications for it. And I feel like this is probably a question a lot of founders have or before they go, before they jump into it. I'll answer that one really quickly. Um, I, I don't have any qualifications and, and you, don't need, you don't need any qualifications either other than the ability to ask questions, to, to validate assumptions and, and to uh, focus, right? Those are the, the, basically the only qualifications you really need. A strong burning passion to solve a problem, the ability to question you know, why things are done a certain way and, and how things can be done better and to keep repeating that process. You don't just come up with one idea and then execute. You, you come up with an idea and then you test that idea. You, you test and you fail and you test and you fail and you fail and you fail and then you succeed a little bit and then, and then you fail again and then you succeed and succeed and succeed until eventually, and you know, I, I hope Feras can talk about his story when we have more time, but that, that's the path that he went down with, with the carbon phone. Um, and it's the same process that everyone, whether you're Elon Musk or, or Firas Khalifa. Thank you, Chad. I think it's a, <clears throat> it's a very, we, we, we wrap it up on a, on a very high note. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank the three of you and everyone in the audience. Thank you especially for, for participating, for opening up, for sharing uh, your experiences, your insights, your thoughts, and your secrets. Um, Obviously, this is the first uh, of many talks that we'll be holding. So look out for us. We'll reach out with more topics, more people, more, more, more gatherings. Um, I would like to, to personally be close saying that <clears throat> I'm really grateful for the conversation we had tonight because it really shows that, showed that there are less barriers than what we think, or at least barriers are somehow equally distributed or almost equally distributed. And the, I think the good message to send out there is that there are people who are willing to help regardless. It's just a matter of uh, taking the first step into this direction of being vocal. So I, I personally encourage everyone who has a dream to come forward, come forward and just ask. There is nothing wrong in not being able, not being qualified, not knowing how to do it. It's, it's just a matter of starting to figure out how to do it. And then I would like, again, thanking you again to uh, pass it on to Shelby, who will be explaining you how the networking part of this event looks like. And I'll mute myself. Do you mind? I just want to say one last thing. No, no, you cannot. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I, I just want to to really maybe um, first of all, I'm sorry for the tone that I brought to the table on the very last. It's, it, it, when that's why I don't like to go outside with it because it's an extremely vulnerable discussion, and I think we try to be as open in this discussion here to okay. as much more to that. I just want to mention as well that I'm extremely grateful. I'm really grateful for being here because. Um, there is no other place like Germany who would support refugees to the way that Germany did. And that was one of the part reasons that I come here before. Uh, I mean, I came to Germany because it's industrial country, all the engineering stuff. I came, to, I chose Berlin because it's a hot startup scene that's happening. And I chose Berlin personally because I know I, I can seek my freedom here and I can, I can earn it. And I got that. There's things to improve. That's, that's it. There's, there's room to improve. So I'm definitely grateful for being here. I'm not saying that because I wanna just try to say anything to anybody. It's it's good to mention the both sides. I'm grateful, but also there's things that are frustrating and I wish they can be fixed. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Vidas. Sure. Great, thank you everyone um, for, for, for speaking today and also for, for joining. Um, I'm excited uh, to, to see what kind of discuss discussions we can have in the uh, um, uh, networking session that we're, we're about to go into. I just dropped the link into, into the chat here. You should have also received it in the email I sent out earlier. Um, so how it works, it's, it's, it's on a platform called Wonder, and I'll actually just show you quickly kind of what it looks like and how to use it to, to make it easier here. Um, so how, you, how it works is you'll have a little avatar and you can move it around with your mouse. And once you join another person, it automatically turns into a video thing. So what we have here, um, we, I have two kind of pre uh, kind of conversation starter areas already put up there, but feel free to break off into your own groups, make your own little pods and move around how, however you want. Um, and, and yeah, for the questions that weren't asked earlier, um, maybe if some of the speakers join or we can all discuss it with each other there as well. Um, yeah, and that's all I have. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you in the networking session here in a bit.